Okay, thanks for inviting me uh, for this invited session. I'm going to talk about uh, reifying socio-technical uh, systems and socio-ecological systems when you're looking into systems change. And this turns out to be about um, changing the philosophy from being from objects to repacing rhythms. Um, I'm with the Creative uh, Systemic Research Platform Institute in Switzerland. I live in Toronto. Um, and I'm going to fly through a lot of slides. Um, so there'll be... Uh, little speed going through this. So the, um, the one idea I'd like to get from this presentation is about changing the way that you look at, um, uh, at systems. Um, so when we talk about socio-technical systems, there's another side of socio-ecological systems that happen at the same time. When you're thinking about socio-technical systems, it's like building on the inside of a car. Uh, what you should be thinking of instead is socio-ecological systems and socio-technical systems together, which is much more like couples dancing in a ballroom, because not only do you have interaction between the uh, people who are dancing together, but you have interactions between the, the whole, the people working together, and the room that's moving. Um, the slides are available at coevolving.com, so you can uh, pick them up there. Uh, and the, the preprint is there. Um, so I'm very briefly going to go over um, these five parts. Uh, the first two are going to be really quick. I'll talk about the history. Uh, I'll do some case studies at the root. Uh, then root metaphor theory is going to get in deep with philosophy. And then we'll take the extension of the contextual dyadic thinking for uh, systems, uh, social technical systems, socio-ecological systems. And then uh, I'll close with the reifying and the implications. So the socio-psychological, socio-technical, and socio-ecological systems perspective were developed concurrently. They're published in three volumes uh, by the Tavistock Institute, but they were all generated at the same time. In effect, the socio-psychological systems perspective uh, you can think of as um, soldiers coming back to the war from the war. And so one perspective would be that you want the soldiers to readjust to society, but the other one that's more important that was looked at that time would be that you need the um, the society to readjust to the soldiers coming back. The socio-technical systems perspective uh, was based in the, in the work in coal mines where they had uh, the, uh, the replacement of men with pickaxes with a long wall machine. And when they put in the machine, that changed the way that the whole, um, uh, the whole work system worked. The socio-ecological systems perspective came as there was a lot of change, particularly industry uh, in the UK that was being um, hit by, uh, by competitors coming in from Europe. And so the question is, how do they deal with that change? So this is the fundamental paper in 1965, The Causal Texture of Organizational Environments by Emery and Trist. Um, and in effect, you see uh, the diagram on the right, which is the internal part-part relations are very much what the socio-technical systems um, uh, perspective is about. However, you have the planning process where the system L12, you have the uh, system impact in the environment, and you have L21, which is the environment impacts the system. Uh, also, you've got L22, which is the environment impacting the environment itself. So the system, which is number one here, is uh, not by itself. You have the environment changing at the same time. The case studies that drove some of this, and this will be very brief, uh, is uh, a book that I had written as part of a dissertation work, Open Innovation Learning. And this was studying uh, seven cases of IBM open sourcing while private sourcing. And so we can take an example, uh, for example, Wiki. Uh, okay, so IBM actually started and it's like, well, we don't know what a wiki is. They started working internally with it, but wiki is an open source technology. So how did they actually learn to use that? And IBM is a commercial company, so it eventually came up with a product that included wiki, but at the same time, it's in the open source community. Now, root metaphor theory is at the foundation of what of we're doing this crossover. The 1969 edition, and this is a system thinking uh, Penguin paperback, um, had this note that said, oh, we have, we're not looking at, at Stephen C. Pepper's work. It's really important, but it's, it's, we're not looking at it. And contextualism is the root metaphor. And so the issue is that, and this is an exchange that happened on LinkedIn, I had done 
<coughs> excuse me, a presentation in January 2022, and Mike Jackson uh, came back and said, "Oh yes, thanks for looking into uh, into pepper. Pepper is important, um, but of course, there's a misunderstanding. In particular, there's misunderstanding with Marilyn Emery, uh, who is the wife of Fred Emery, um, and so there's a, there's a disagreement about how you approach socio-technical systems and what contextualism means to socio-technical systems." So this is a, a summary of Pepper's world hypotheses. And uh, world hypotheses, in effect, are world theories. And he's got them organized along dimensions of analytic, synthetic. Analytic means taking things apart. Synthetic means putting things together. And dispersive and integrative, which uh, dispersive is, you can think more like gases and things dispersing and then integrating together. So we start off with um, formism. Formism, uh, the example he talks about is usually a yellow sheet of paper. And so similarity, well, yellow sheet of paper, I say that people go, oh, I understand what that is, it's yellow. You know, it could be different sizes, different shapes, it could have writing, not have writing, but they have the same form. The nature of time is universal or irrelevant. And so when we talk about this, we say that uh, the, um, that uh, yellow paper is yellow paper, so it doesn't really matter. Uh, if we go to mechanism, we get the, we get machines, um, and that's uh, a, a machine is something well, we're familiar. It produces, it works, those sorts of things. The nature of time here is schematic, um, so it works in time. It's linear in dimension. Organicism is constructed development, and so you can think of going from an egg to um, uh, um, a, uh, into the chicken, you can think about growing from a, uh, a teen into an adult, and there's a directional arrow and there's successive integrations. Contextualism is the one that's misunderstood. The root metaphor is situation as a historic event in its living actuality. In this, there's a qualitative duration, an event relative to a species present. So this is about how we feel time. Uh, it's not like organicism, and it's not like mechanism, because the way that we approach time is different. So we could back into these, and, uh, and you can start um, breaking it down into the socio-ecological and socio-technical perspectives. And so this is a proposal of the way you'd look at it. So we also have the idea of uh, ecological, which is a perspective, and ecocultural, what they've created a new name. Um, and they we combine from the socio-ecological, as opposed to the technical and socio-psychological that come together into the socio-technical. OK. Now, what I've proposed is contextualism dyadicism at the bottom here. Uh, the root metaphor here is yin-yang dan dancing through eight seasons, and we're into Chinese philosophy to explain that, and I'll get a little bit more into that. The categories that are distinctive about it are rhythmic shifts, contexture, and propensity. Um, and so uh, when we're looking at contextualism, the rhythm sh rhythmic shifts happen inside the system, and they happen outside the system. The contexture is how things weave together. The propensity is of the system itself. If you left the system alone, what is the propensity for it to do something? The nature of time is chirotic. That's not clock time. Chirotic means felt time. So the ancient Greeks think about things linearly and thinking about straight line, point to point sorts of activities. Classical Greeks think about science as yin-yang with rhythmic complements. And so as opposed to thinking about straight lines, we should be thinking about sine waves. Now yin-yang is dyadic, and so it's tricky because we need, head, I need to step outside of the Western interpretation of Chinese philosophy, where there's a separation of the material and the immaterial. So you could talk about mind and body being separate. And what happens here is that uh, you've got uh, a, a, these are processes, they are not structures. You've got two processes happening, and you've got the process of qi in dissipating mode and qi in concentrating mode, and they both happen together in a dyadic way. So if you're familiar with the Taiji symbol, you've got this idea of yin-yang, and people don't think about this. One way of thinking about this is that you have it like going around a clock, and so at 12 o'clock at noon, you have utmost yang, you have the sunset, and then you have utmost yin, but this is a process that happens, and talking about yin-yang without talking about time um, is kind of the wrong way to look at it. You have the same thing in the body clock, and this is how Chinese medicine works. So there's the challenge with, uh, with the um, qi being atmosphere, it is both matter and not matter, and so the idea of waxing and waning comes in. And waxing and waning is a lot, uh, is like we think about phases of the moon, but it's based in time. 
Now, if you think about how these things map together, you have the circle, and the circle, if you put it into a different display, turns into sine waves. But the sine waves are continuously moving. Um, you have to get into yin yang as the, as the way that that the classical Chinese, maybe not the modern Chinese, the classical Chinese have, and it's embedded in the culture. You have the ideas that of illuminating, darkening, working, resting. Working, resting is a good example because in Western philosophy, it's like, oh, you're working and we want you to work more. And it goes, well, in Chinese philosophy, you need to rest. You can't just work all the time. In Chinese medicine, there's pathologies, and so we start off with the system of interest, which would be in the center, and you have yin-yang in the normal range, but there are conditions so that yin and yang are out of sync with each other. Not they're, they're, oh, sorry, they're out of, um, they're not in proportion to each other, and it gets tricky with how you describe yin-yang, because it is not states. These are processes, and you have processes that are not working together. So I'll talk briefly now and close this out with reifying and the implications. Um, so the, uh, you have the reifying of philosophy, the reifying of theory, and the reifying of practice. And you have to change the root metaphors from being about objects to being about rhythms. And so um, the example I'm using here is if you think about the wet markets in, 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 um, in Asia, uh, you have boats flowing, the boats all come together, that's where the market is. When the market moves, uh, the, the, the people come together in the market, in the boats, the people come meet them in the boats, but the market dissipates, it's not something that is, um, is steady. So the philosophy is changing, you have to deprecate, thinking about state lines, straight, straight lines and jumps and move towards rhythms and anticipation. Um, the theory is uh, moving away from a re reduction down to one into threads corresponding. And working in twos and saying that you always have to think in twos is actually counter to the way we normally West think about Western philosophy. And reifying practice, normally we think about systems change as unfreeze, move, refreeze, but we need to think about it as contextual dyadic rhythmic learning. Uh, the way to think about a changing systems change is, uh, is to move from, uh, is to increase the idea of living systems and less think less about machines. Um, the plant here grows, we're trying, to, uh, re re trying to revive it, it may or may not actually work. It's not like working on a clock. So philosophically, we focus more on when and where over what and why. Theoretically, we have the chaotic rhythms, the dyadic diachrony, and the situational propensity. That's not future state and current state. And in practical, we have doing no harm as opposed to the bias for action. So closing off, um, this is the metaphor again. When we're thinking about systems and socio-technical systems, we're not just working inside the car. We're not just building cars. You have to think about how the world is changing around you. And so the metaphor of a couple's dancing in a room of couples dancing is the one that I'd like you to uh, think about. Thanks. Okay, thank you, David. Now it's time for questions. Uh, that's a question, uh, the dyadic uh, from... Uh, yes, please, Thanks. I had a question about, I think, the last slide, about uh, going from unfreeze uh, into the dyadic, is dyadic the yin and yang as the two processes? Yes. Or, yeah, okay. Yeah, and, and the, the problem is dyadic is not dualistic. Um, right. So so that's when you get into the philosophy because it's about processes, it's not about structures, it's not about changes in state. Yeah. Any other questions? No. Okay. Yes. Yeah, okay. Can you make some comments on practical application from your perspective? The, the practical applications is that... Uh, is, so in Western philosophy, the socio-ecological and socio-technical systems are two different perspectives. And so you switch between them. And so if we take the open source versus private sourcing example that I had at IBM, in effect, you would say, oh, socio-technically, IBM needs to build software and sell software. And you're focused mostly internally on your developers. The open source community is outside the organization, though. 
So how does IBM interact socio-ecologically? And you go, oh, that's a different thing. Well, no. What's happening is that the software in the, so in the, in the um, open source community is developing at the same time as IBM is developing software internally. So saying that there's two different perspectives, you go, okay, well, one will focus inside the enterprise, but one will focus outside the enterprise is counterproductive because the other way of looking at it would be they're both happening at the same time. You need to deal with both of them together. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you very much.